In the 70s, there was a period when I lacked a stable place to live. Essentially, all I had was an old pickup truck and a teardrop camper. To sustain myself, I took up odd jobs, earning enough for gas and food. Back then, it wasn't too challenging to find spots for parking where I could get some sleep. Often, I sought out secluded places off the beaten path, relishing the privacy. Finding a spot for the night meant uninterrupted sleep, although occasionally, a police officer or park ranger might request you to relocate. Rangers rarely did this unless they suspected illegal activities. Nowadays, it's doubtful that young people could easily replicate the freedom we had nearly 50 years ago. Despite not having many thrilling or scary stories from those camper days, there's one that never fails to send chills down people's spines. This incident occurred while I was traversing the mountains. Exploring off-roads into the woods was a common pastime. During colder months, I'd park my truck and camper in a serene spot, enjoying the solitude before embarking on the job search routine again. This story unfolds during a period with minimal snow, but the leaves and needles were transitioning, casting a brown and falling hue. On the third consecutive night at a specific mountain spot, a relentless windstorm began. Teardrop campers, those tiny trailers shaped like teardrops, offer limited space. But as I didn't mind the lack of room, it wasn't a concern. However, being extremely light, they shook violently in strong winds. As the wind howled through the trees that night, it rattled the camper forcefully. I knew it would be a challenge to sleep, but I brushed it off, enjoying some beers and tuning into the radio. The gusts would hit the camper, shaking it and occasionally startling me. It was pretty late at night when the wind reached its peak. The wind continued to batter my camper, and suddenly, I heard a forceful smacking against its walls. It resembled the sound of someone pounding their hand against the side. Alarmed, I suspected a park ranger might be investigating my presence. I cautiously opened the door, only to find no one outside. Stepping into the windy night, I scanned the surroundings, expecting a ranger's truck but nothing was in sight. Convinced it might be debris or a loose part of the camper, I returned inside. About 20 minutes later, the similar noise persisted. This time, I went out, flashlight in hand, determined to identify the source. In the darkness, I carefully inspected the camper for any issues, but found nothing amiss. Frustration grew with each occurrence, even though my inspections revealed no problems. The third time it happened, my frustration intensified. Despite another thorough check, I couldn't find anything wrong. Resigned to the mystery, I tried to sleep. The calming effect of the beers helped me drift off despite the unsettling experiences. By morning, the wind had subsided. I decided to inspect the camper in daylight only to make a chilling discovery. Someone had left a message on my door. If you checked in the truck, you would be dead. Shocked, I noticed the truck's driver's side door ajar. I always left it unlocked, never anticipating a threat in such a remote location. I realized whoever had pounded on the camper likely sneaked into the cab and closed the door silently. It was a disturbing revelation, and I felt fortunate not to have encountered the intruder. Fast forward to a recent incident in my rural area just outside a small town. Living on a dirt road that led downhill to a highway, I often walked into town. The other day, I decided to stroll to the liquor store, contemplating the need for exercise before drinking. The weather was pleasant not as cold as before. As I walked along the highway to the shopping area, I couldn't shake off the eerie memories of that night in the mountains. Time and drawing lines with a pencil, 
It's weird, man. He seemed agitated, his eyes filled with that same contemptuous expression. I decided to keep my distance and quickened my pace. As I continued walking, I heard him shouting behind me, demanding an explanation for my problem. I didn't engage and focused on reaching the store. Inside the shop, I hoped to put the strange encounter behind me. I completed my purchases and started my journey back. I was relieved not to see him immediately and felt even better as I progressed along the road, turning onto the highway where our paths first crossed. There was no sign of him. However, when I reached the original building where he had given me that unsettling look, I was in for a surprise. The building was at the corner of the dirt road leading to my house. As I turned the corner, there he was, waiting and leaning against the building. Startled, I jumped, and I could see that he too was taken aback by my reaction. He yelled at me, demanding to know why I was walking away and accusing me of having a problem. I turned to face him briefly, explaining that his unexpected presence startled me and I didn't have any issue with him. He seemed to calm down for a moment, but then his demeanor shifted again. Why have you been watching me the whole damn time and drawing lines with a pencil? It's weird, man, I pointed out, hoping to get some clarity. Instead, he became more agitated, his gaze intense and unsettling. I decided it was best to continue walking, leaving him behind. As I distanced myself, his shouts echoed, but I focused on getting home. The strange behavior and the feeling of being watched lingered in my mind, leaving me uneasy about the encounter camp in a secluded spot and enjoy the peace and solitude. On one occasion, however, my camping experience took an unexpected turn. During my solo camping trips, I aimed to venture deeper into the woods each time. Our rural home was surrounded by hills with scattered houses and seemingly unused land. It was an ideal environment for my outdoor adventures. One late summer day, at the age of 15, I set out for another camping expedition. With school looming on the horizon, I wanted to make the most of my time in the wilderness. The plan was familiar. Find a secluded spot, set up camp, and relish the tranquility. As I ventured into the woods, I relished the freedom of being away from people and the opportunity to explore new places. Despite the hilly terrain and scattered houses, encounters with others were rare during my camping excursions. On this particular camping trip, something unexpected occurred. I found a serene spot, set up my camp, and settled in for the night. The quietness of the woods was broken only by the sounds of nature. However, as darkness fell, I began to sense an eerie presence around me. In the distance, I heard faint rustling and occasional footsteps. At first, I dismissed it as normal woodland sounds, but the noises persisted. Feeling a bit uneasy, I decided to investigate. I cautiously moved toward the source of the sounds, trying not to make my presence known. To my surprise, I stumbled upon a small clearing where a dim light flickered. In the clearing, there was an old abandoned house. The light emanated from a cracked window, revealing shadows moving inside. I watched in silence, unsure of what was unfolding. Suddenly, I heard whispers and hushed voices. My curiosity got the better of me, and I inched closer to get a better view through the window. Peering inside, I saw a group of people, dressed in tattered clothes, engaged in some kind of ritual. Candles cast an eerie glow on their faces as they chanted in a language I couldn't understand. Fear gripped me, and I quickly retreated into the darkness. The unsettling scene left me shaken, and 
I decided to abandon my campsite, making my way back home under the cover of night. The encounter in the woods was a surreal experience that lingered in my memories, shaping the way I approached solo camping in the years that followed. Raw energy of the music. It's an experience like no other. However, one metal concert experience I had took an unexpected turn. It was a night filled with intense performances and headbanging rhythms. The crowd was alive with energy, and I was fully immersed in the music. As the night progressed, the atmosphere became electric, and the anticipation for the headlining band reached its peak. In the midst of the pulsating beats and enthusiastic cheers, I felt a tap on my shoulder. Turning around, I was surprised to see a friend I hadn't seen in years. We exchanged excited greetings, and he mentioned he had an extra VIP pass that he was willing to share with me. Thrilled by the unexpected opportunity, I eagerly accepted. The VIP section offered a prime view of the stage, and the excitement grew as the headlining band prepared to perform. The lights dimmed, and the crowd roared with anticipation. The first notes resonated through the venue, and everyone was caught in the infectious energy of the performance. However, as the night unfolded, I noticed an increasingly unusual occurrence. A group of people near us seemed overly fixated on the headlining act, exhibiting peculiar behavior that deviated from the typical concert enthusiasm. They were whispering among themselves, exchanging furtive glances, and occasionally pointing towards the stage. Initially dismissing it as mere excitement, my unease grew when their behavior became more intense. They seemed to be communicating in a way that went beyond the usual concert camaraderie. Curiosity turned into concern, and I began to feel a sense of discomfort in the midst of the pulsating music. As the concert reached its peak, the group suddenly shifted their attention away from the stage and towards the crowd. Their behavior became more erratic, and it became apparent that something was amiss. In the dim light and chaotic atmosphere, I couldn't discern their intentions, but it was clear they were not there solely for the music. Feeling uneasy and wanting to distance myself from the peculiar group, I decided to leave the VIP section and join the general crowd. As I navigated through the sea of metalheads, the intensity of the music served as a backdrop to the unfolding events. Fortunately, the remainder of the concert passed without incident, and I left the venue with a mix of exhilaration from the music and lingering unease from the unexpected encounter. It was a stark reminder that even in the midst of a thrilling and familiar environment, unpredictability can take center stage adding an unexpected layer to the metal concert experience. The pounding beat that sends shivers up your spine, there's truly nothing like it. However, the very atmosphere that creates such an electrifying experience can also be a breeding ground for unexpected and potentially dangerous activities. I learned this the hard way during my last concert experience. I attended a concert with a friend to see, in this moment, Avatar, New Year's Day, and my personal favorite, Ice Nine Kills, as part of their terror tour. Despite the ominous name, the concert was amazing. The bands played all our favorites, and we, like typical teenage metalheads, screamed along with all the passion we could muster. New Year's Day opened the show and the flashing lights created spots in my eyes. Avatar took the stage next, and the first half of their set went flawlessly. The ominous angle they played up, referring to being with the devil between songs, sent chills up my spine. The atmosphere was electric, and the crowd
crowd on the floor was going absolutely wild. I even witnessed someone in the pit getting lifted into the air and crowd surfing. Then came one of my favorite songs from Avatar's new album. The excitement was palpable. And as the music and vocals built up, the crowd reached a frenzied state. Just as the chorus was about to erupt, the lead vocalist froze, letting out a strangled sound into the mic. The other band members stopped playing. And the only sound was the quickly fading reverb from the stage amps. The crowd seemed to collectively hold its breath, and little puffs of smoke from the bodies on the floor were visible, as if representing someone whose soul had just been scared out of them. People around us started murmuring, and confusion spread through the audience. The singer tried to compose himself, but no one on stage provided any explanations. Suddenly, he shouted into the mic, Security? Can we get security here now? The lights in the arena flicked on, flooding the space with stark white light after over an hour in the dark. It was almost blinding after being immersed in the dim atmosphere. As our eyes adjusted, we could see that near the front of the stage, a small circle had formed in the crowd, giving a wide berth to someone crumpled into a heap on the floor. The atmosphere, once charged with excitement, took on an eerie tension as we awaited more information on what had just transpired and started screaming. Security pushed their way through the remaining concert goers, immediately running to the injured person with first aid in tow. They struggled to turn him over and he curled around himself as if in pain. From my vantage point, it was hard to see, but it seemed like his hands were clasped firmly against his stomach. When security finally got him onto his back, the guy's hands accidentally fell to the side, revealing a baseball-sized bubble of blood that exploded across his shirt. He had been holding the blood in his hands, praying it wouldn't spill out. Realizing their mistake, security pressed firmly against the wound. Panicked concert goers called 911, and 20 minutes later, EMS and police arrived with flashing lights and stretchers. We were all told to stay calm and quickly directed outside to the parking lot. My friend and I clung to each other through the surge to avoid getting separated. We didn't speak for a long time, not even on the drive back. About a month later, we saw news reports about the incident. Apparently, someone thought the guy shoved against them in the mosh pit was hitting on their girlfriend or something. They pulled out a knife and began stabbing him in the stomach. The assailant pleaded guilty, citing extreme intoxication at the time, but that didn't lessen the severity of their sentence. How they managed to sneak a knife past security personnel remains a mystery, highlighting that even in a seemingly carefree concert atmosphere, reckless and dangerous situations can unfold when emotions run high. On a lighter note, the Taste of Waterville in Maine is an annual food festival that offers a culinary showcase from every corner of the town. It features small independent eateries, chain restaurants, family-owned pancake houses, and even places where breweries can sample their products. The last time I attended, being newly 21, I could legally buy drinks from the stands. The 21 plus section, surrounded by ropes, was a bit removed from the festival. Next to a large field where a band played, it provided a diverse and enjoyable experience for both locals and outsiders alike. Name came to me. I had a taste of a new sample drink every time a new song started. And my memories after that are a bit scattered. With a sober brain filling in the pieces, here's what I recall. I found myself standing by a strawberry beer stand in the corner 
for a company whose name escapes me. That's when a random girl named Amanda walked up and started chatting. She had long blonde locks, an athletic build, and was wearing glasses, exactly my type. She was very physical right away, touching my arms and complimenting me. I hadn't experienced that kind of attention before, so I was into the vibe we were building. Drunkenly, I offered to buy us some food, and she agreed. We waited in line for chicken wings, both sharing a liking for spicier ones. Grabbing a table, we sat across from each other, chatting about anything that came to mind, messily eating wings and having a great time. The sunset behind her gave a pink tinge to the top of her head, making her even more beautiful through the beer haze. Determined to get her number, I asked her outright. She seemed surprised but happy. Taking out a Sharpie from her bag, and writing her number across my arm, just like in the movies. She then suggested going behind the trees for some privacy. Who was I to say no? With inhibitions removed, she practically dragged me through the crowd. A bit out from the festival, we found an old footbridge stretching across an adjacent river. On the other side was an abandoned toll shack and a stretch of trees the perfect place for the privacy we needed. As Amanda led the way, my shoes clacked on the wooden bridge, and my gaze was drawn to the rushing river, turning a deep blue-black with the already set sun. Vague thoughts crossed my mind about the bridge, possibly snapping and sending us tumbling down forty feet, but I quickly got over it, reaching the shack. Amanda pulled me inside with unexpected strength. I was on cloud nine, anticipating the first kiss and everything that follows, when Amanda's name suddenly came to me. Perfect spot for the privacy we needed. However, things took a drastic turn when Amanda's entire personality changed and the situation went downhill. She scowled, pressed me against the wall, and someone ran up behind her, delivering a square punch to my face, pushing me to the ground. The assailant, a big guy, kept assaulting me while Amanda started laughing. I lost consciousness and woke up hours later with a splitting headache, disoriented and with a hangover. My wallet and phone were missing, and I couldn't remember where I was. A lady on the road offered to drive me to the hospital, and I discovered my nose was broken. Amanda and her partner in crime were never found, and the phone number she gave turned out to be fake. Lesson learned. Don't let random strangers drag you across a bridge without being sober. Against our better judgment, my roommate found us an apartment on Craigslist while we were scrambling to secure a place before graduating college. Eager for independence, and for her to avoid moving across the country, we settled for a cheap, rundown place. It turned out to be a trailer on the landlord's property, but it was surprisingly nice, with carpeted floors, a spacious, open kitchen, two large bedrooms, and a charming blue color scheme. It had its appeal. The front even had a garden with flowers in bloom. While we didn't know the landlord well, he seemed accommodating. However, little did we know that our new home would bring its own set of challenges. Windows and kept them down. If he was outside, we both knew we had to get out of that place fast. Things were starting to get scary for both of us so I tried to confront him about it in person. I caught him in the act of sitting in his truck outside our place one night. He seemed surprised to see me. I asked him flat out what he was doing, why he was always sitting out there, why he seemed to look angry. Sometimes he tried to play it off as just keeping an eye on his property, but I wasn't buying it. It was too personal and I could see the anger in his eyes. 
even though he was trying to hide it. We ended up getting out of there early, breaking the lease, and finding a new place to live. We didn't even take any of our furniture with us, for fear that he would follow us to the new place. He never took any legal action against us. For breaking the lease, which was a huge relief, we later found out that he had a history of stalking tenants and making their lives miserable. If they rejected his advances, we were lucky to get out when we did, but it left us both feeling violated and uneasy in our own homes for a long time. After that, my advice to anyone looking for a place to rent is to thoroughly research the landlord and the property. History don't let desperation cloud your judgment and always trust your instincts. If something feels off it, probably is don't be afraid to speak up and take action to protect yourself and your peace of mind. Ten tu, perikut paragraf yang telah diperbaiki dengan penambahan tanda baka dan perbaikan struktur. Growing up, the way I would describe my grandmother's house was peculiar. Brown popcorn ceilings bled into tan walls that spilled into a brown linoleum floor in her kitchen. The living room walls were a deep chestnut brown that seemed to absorb all light coming into the shuttered window, if any seemed to get in at all. Even the carpet covering the rest of the house was brown, chocolate to be exact, or perhaps the color of mud, depending on how you looked at it. All in all, the house had a dark, dreamy effect that I really couldn't explain until much, much later in my life. And by that time, the explanation horrified me. This isn't one of those stories where your grandmother's house is haunted with ghosts or anything like that. No, it's much worse. Growing up, my grandmother would often tell me stories about her youth and her family. She grew up in a small town and her family was known for being a bit eccentric, especially her father, my great-grandfather. He was a tall man with dark hair and a thin mustache. From the pictures I saw of him, he had a certain charisma about him that drew people in. He was involved in various community activities and was well-liked by many. However, as the stories unfolded during my visits, it became clear that there was a darker side to him that my grandmother would only allude to in hushed tones. Apparently, my great-grandfather was heavily involved in a cult or secret society of some kind. It wasn't the Hollywood version of a cult with robes and chanting, but more of a hidden organization with its own set of rules and rituals. My grandmother never went into too much detail but she mentioned strange gatherings that took place in the basement of their house late at night. She spoke of whispered conversations in a language she couldn't understand, and a pervasive sense of dread that lingered in the air during those meetings. It wasn't until I was older that I started connecting the dots. The dark color scheme of my grandmother's house wasn't just a matter of personal taste. It was a reflection of the sinister activities that had taken place within its walls. The deep browns and muted tones served to create an atmosphere of secrecy and concealment. My great-grandfather's charisma wasn't just charm. It was a tool to draw people into his web of influence and control. I couldn't help but feel a chill down my spine every time I visited my grandmother's house, as if the very walls were silently whispering the secrets of the past. It's unsettling to think about the hidden history that lurked beneath the surface of what seemed like a normal family home. My grandmother never explicitly stated what the cult or secret society was about, or what its ultimate goals were but the implications were disturbing enough to leave a lasting impression on me. It's a reminder 
that sometimes the most ordinary looking places can harbor the darkest secrets, and that the past can cast a long and unsettling shadow on the present. I'm sorry to hear about the challenging situation you and your family went through. Here's the paragraph with improved punctuation and structure. Discovering her entire house had been infected with black mold inside the walls, down through the cellar, and most notably, directly under the thin brown carpet that coated the living room. The same carpet I pressed my face against day after day for years, indirectly inhaling hundreds of mold spores. Now, that may not seem like the scariest thing in the world. After all, molding food in your fridge just gets thrown away and forgotten in five minutes. But let me tell you about the effects of exposure to black mold, especially when it's long-term. Body aches, pains, wheezing, cough, shortness of breath, memory issues, and weight loss, all leading to the most dangerous outcome of all. Mycotoxicosis or mold poisoning. Now it all made sense. My constant illness, grandma's frailty, and memory issues. Everything. With how much mold they found in the house, we were being poisoned the entire time. My parents immediately rushed to get me checked out. But fortunately, no long-term damage had taken place, and I was able to fully recover. My grandma was a different story, though. Living day in and day out in that mold-infested house had accelerated her developing Alzheimer's, and she never fully recovered. 